Okay, today's scripture is John 11, 1 through 7 and 17 through 44. Uh, if you would like a physical Bible, just raise your hands and the ushers can run you one. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. After she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there was a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Hey, well, happy Easter to you. It's so good to be with you celebrating. Uh, it was said earlier that Christ, uh, Easter is the Super Bowl of the Christian faith. That really is true. Although unlike the Super Bowl, Easter is something we can celebrate every day for every day to come. It's, it's such wonderful news. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And we're so excited to get to celebrate with, with each and every one of you. If you're checking out Current for the first time, a friend brought you, or you got a mailer, or you just, I don't know, found yourself here for whatever reason, we're especially glad you're here. It's as the gal said earlier, Current is a community following Jesus together, and you're welcome wherever you're at on your spiritual journey. We hope today would not only be a good experience for you, encouraging, but also a time in which you can experience the community here at Current and, and get a sense that you too can belong. Uh, we'd love to have you uh, join this growing church community with us. Well, uh, before any of you wonder or continue to wonder, uh, 
why are we in this text of all texts on Easter? Who's this Lazarus guy and what does he have to do with Easter? Uh, this account is very much about Easter indeed. Uh, it's, it's not so much an account about Lazarus as it is an account about Jesus and about his death and his resurrection. And what he goes on to say, of course, here in this text, in verse 25, very famously, is, I am the resurrection and the life. And so today, I believe we see in this text, uh, not only the key to understanding Easter, but the key to understanding, really, all of the Bible, all of Christianity. So what is Easter about? What is the Bible about? And, and, how, and what can that mean for our lives today? Uh, let me pray, and then we'll, we'll jump into it. Father, thank you so much for the empty tomb. Thank you that uh, we get to celebrate not just on a day like today, but every day that he is risen. And that he is, because he is the resurrection and the life, we too can have life forever with him. And so, Father, we just pray that today you would give us your spirit to understand what it is you have in front of us. I want to pray, especially for those who are here today. Maybe, maybe they're coming in a little bit with their arms crossed, wondering why they even came to begin with. But I pray that you'd especially speak to them, that you'd reveal yourself to them through, through your spirit, through, through your word. And then, Father, I pray for, you know, the longtime follower of Jesus, that uh, you, would, you would speak to everyone wherever they are in their, in their spiritual walk. And you would uh, open up to them, to us uh, what it is you have for us today. Uh, we pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, well, what I thought we could do to get us into this text is ask three questions of it. Three questions that I think uh, are not only intriguing questions, they are also questions that help us unlock what's going on here. So the first question is, why did Jesus delay? Did you notice that he delayed there? I mean, I'm, I'm wondering if, if, if as it was read, you're like, what, what's the deal? What's, what's going on? Uh, because what had happened was Jesus had been out and about, probably outside of Jerusalem, a ways. Uh, we don't know exactly where he was, but he was at least about a day's journey, probably a little bit more, away from this little village outside of Jerusalem called Bethany. Well, some messengers out of Bethany had come to try to find Jesus and to tell him that his buddy, Lazarus, whom he loved dearly, had gone uh, so, so sick that it seemed to everybody that he was getting ready to pass away and pass away probably in the near future. And you can only imagine as they came to him, they were essentially saying, hey, Jesus, you know, Lazarus, the guy you love, your dear friend, back in Bethany, he's, he's sick. You got you to get, ba get back and do your miracle thing because he's not going to last too much longer. Like, let's go. Only here's what we're told in verse 6. So when Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Like, what's up with that? Like, why the delay? I mean, imagine if somebody had a terrible accident, heaven forbid, in your life, and it's not looking good. They have hours or not that long of time, and you just decide, well, I'll get around to seeing them eventually. I mean, it's kind of like that. Why, why was Jesus delaying? Well, thankfully, with this question, we don't actually have to speculate the, at what the answer is here, because Jesus explicitly tells us in, back in verse 4, speaking to his disciples, so his followers, he says, this sickness will not end in death. No, here he says, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. It's for God's glory this happened, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. There's so much we could say about this verse, but just for the sake of time, uh, let's just consider this. I mean, what we see here is Jesus is saying no suffering is meaningless. We see, to Jesus, no suffering is meaningless. If, if we could take anything away from these, these uh, words, it's that Jesus is saying there's purpose in it all. Now, we might not necessarily understand what purpose God has for in any specific suffering, but there's always a reason. There's always something, whether we can get our heads around it in the, in the midst of it or in hindsight, there, no suffering is meaningless to Jesus. I read a book not too long ago on uh, pain and suffering, and I really appreciated the book because it kind of took a, a two-pronged approach. It was looking at, at pain and suffering on a personal level, and then it was looking at pain and suffering on a, on a more philosophical level. And what I found in, in these books is they tend to focus on one over the other. But in the philosophical section of this book on pain and suffering, the author made the point that of all the life philosophies in the world, so religious or secular, of all life philosophies in the world, it is 
modern day Western secular society that is least equipped to face suffering. Here's how the author put it. In the secular view, this material world is all there is. And so the meaning of life is to have the freedom to choose a life that makes you happy. However, in that view of things, suffering can have no meaningful part. It is a complete interruption of your life story. It cannot be a meaningful part of the story. In this approach to life, suffering should be avoided at almost any cost or minimized to the greatest degree possible. This means that when facing unavoidable and irreducible suffering, secular people must smuggle in resources from other views of life. One of the biggest and and greatest promises in the scripture is Romans 8.28 that says, "For for we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. We know in all things God works for the good of those who love him, meaning including Included in all things are things like pain and suffering. Even death, God promises to work for the good of those who love him. Now, that begs the question, though, how? Like, like how can that be? How is that not just pie in the sky, wishful thinking? Well, the answer to that is because of Easter. Second question, why did Jesus weep? So we're told that Jesus eventually gets to Bethany where Lazarus had, had become sick. And by the time he gets to Bethany, Lazarus had already died and been in the tomb for four days. And there's this funeral procession going on. And we're told in the midst of all this, all this is going on, people mourning and all, all the rest of it, quote, Jesus wept. John eleven thirty five. Jesus wept. And I actually know that reference and verse very well because that was probably the very first verse I ever memorized as a little kid. It's the shortest verse in the Bible. My church growing up had a memory program, memorization program, that if you pick any verse or verses and memorize it, you could use it towards getting credit, towards getting micro-machine cars. You remember those things? And as a little guy, that was the world to me. And you better believe the first verse I looked for was the shortest one, John 11.35, Jesus wept. Give me my micro-machine car, please. (laughs) Shortest verse in the Bible, but arguably also the most powerful verse in the Bible. Incidentally, have you ever been around a grown man weeping? I have. I can recall one time in my life where I was in person where a grown man was weeping, and dare I describe it as scary. If nothing else, it was deeply unnerving. Jesus wasn't just crying. He wasn't just shedding a tear or two here. He was, quote, weeping. Why? I mean, let's play with this for a second. Let's say you had the ability to raise people to life, okay? And you're getting ready to do it. How would you go about doing that? How would you be feeling? I'm guessing you wouldn't be weeping. You'd be like, watch what I'm getting ready to do. Jesus was weeping. And what's more, why was he weeping when he had been laying the groundwork all along with his disciples, explicitly saying, hey, I'm getting ready to raise this guy to life. And, spoiler alert, he would go on to do just that, raise the guy to life. Why, if he was setting up all along and he knows he's getting ready to do it, why would he weep? I think the answer to that is because we see that pain, suffering, and death, most of all, break the heart of God. I love that new song that we sung today where it says, there's a God who weeps. Jesus wept, even in the face of going to deal with Lazarus' death, to raise him again to life, Jesus still was overcome with deep sadness, mourning for him to weep. The reason for that is because pain, suffering, death are all an intrusion. They are all not how the world or our lives were meant to be. There's a book written by a scholar where the title really kind of summarizes everything uh, just in and of itself. The the book's called uh, The Vandalism of Shalom. Maybe you've heard that term before, shalom. Shalom. It's an ancient Hebrew word, ancient Hebrew concept. It translates roughly into English as peace or harmony. Really, we don't have a good one-for-one word to translate it. What shalom in a greater sense means is an interwovenness with God. It's a wellness of everything being the way it ought or was intended to be with God, that everything is just the way it was supposed to be. Perfect peace, perfect harmony, everything, no no pain, no... And the point of that book 
really the point of the Bible, is that shalom has been vandalized and we were the ones who vandalized it. And, you know, I've lived enough life to know that uh, as much as I don't want to do this myself, I've, so to speak, vandalized shalom all the time, including with the people I love. Even, even without ill intent or, or intentionally, I find that even the people I love and care for my own family, I, I will regularly do the things that the Bible calls sin, the things apart from God, what he, apart from what he calls me to do, that vandalize shalom. So things like selfishness, live selfishly, live with lack of gentleness or kindness or lack of patience or not giving benefit of the doubt. You just name. And it's, it's like almost on a, on a daily basis I participate in the vandalism of shalom, even unintentionally or not wanting to. This is what the Bible calls sin. And, and the scriptures are clear. Romans 6.23 puts it very succinctly. The wages of sin or the results of sin is death. Now, whenever the Bible talks about death, it's not just talking about death in a physical way, at least in, in, in this verse. It's often talking about death, not just physically, but spiritually. And when it talks about death spiritually, the wages of sin is death, it's talking about ultimately separation. And, you know, just to play this out, even if you've never lived with the concept of sin or, or how we're describing it right now, you, we can all see how the ways that we live the, the ways that we live in, in this regard, selfishness, sin, like how, how the Bible describes sin, when we live these ways, it easily incurs separation. Wouldn't you say? You know, we could do a little small slight with somebody and just all of a sudden there's a separation between us. Maybe it's a small separation. Maybe, we're, maybe a number of us in this room are experiencing large separation. Well, the greatest separation of all is with God, and that's, because, and that's through death. If I were to ask you, what is the greatest enemy of humankind? I wonder how we would answer that question, right? What is, what is the greatest enemy of humankind? War? Guns? Processed foods? The Bible doesn't mince around it. The, the greatest enemy of humankind is death and sin that leads to death, this separation from God, the greatest of all relationships. We have been separated our, ourselves. And you know, uh, I, I enjoy from time to time, I'm no expert at it, but I enjoy reading philosophy. And one of, one of uh, a really fun things I came across um, a little while ago was a philosopher's take on philosophy, a secular guy, philosopher's take on philosophy. And he said essentially this, all philosophy amounts to being about one thing, and that one thing is death. His whole idea is philosophy, any philosophy, ultimately comes down to dealing with and working out our mortality. There's a guy named Julian Barnes who's known for being an atheist. He's, he's written some memoirs on death, has never, got, never went to church, never went to Sunday school, never was baptized. But here's what he wrote. I don't believe in God, but I miss him. I don't believe in God, but I miss it. I remember the first time I read those words, and I thought, wow, what a profoundly honest thought, but what else, what about, what an incredible profound thought. And it seems that death has a way of helping us understand at the deep level, in the, in the intuition, in the depths of our soul, that we've experienced separation from God. And I would just say, you know, I've, I've had the, the humble privilege of doing a number of funerals, you know, as a pastor. I've had, I've had to do many here at Current. Very um, grateful the Lord spared us from a lot of that as a young church. But I've had the privilege of doing a number of funerals. And, you know, one of the things I've just seen in, in, in every funeral is, on the one hand, you, of course, see people mourning their loved one, right? And that's just, that's just, that's, that's it. At the same time, I've always, without exception, seen so many people, as they're doing that, also confront in themselves their own mortality. I mean, to the degree where it's almost palpable, you can, like, see it in, the, in, in their eyes. Like, deer in the headlights, like, what, what does this mean? Where, where does this all, what does this all mean? Where is this all headed? Uh, the King Solomon, in the Book of Wisdom, Ecclesiastes, in the Bible, said it this way. It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. For death is the destiny of everyone. The living should take this to heart. Uh, this is why Jesus wept. In the face of getting ready to raise Lazarus to the dead, 
from the dead to life, he still wept because it, because pain, suffering, and death, most of all, is an intrusion, terrible intrusion. Third, last question. Why did Jesus cry out? There's a bit of a, a shift or transformation that happens in this account where Jesus goes from weeping to more or less starting to gird himself up for what's coming, okay? And we see that uh, a little bit in the way that we can understand it in the English, but all the more in the original language. So allow me to kind of go there with you for a moment, but this this is really good stuff. So in verse 38, our English translation says, Jesus deeply moved came to the the tomb. That word deeply moved is actually a very rich word in the Greek. It's actually often used back then to uh, describe a horse snorting. Now, I haven't grown up on a farm, so, you know, but I've seen enough movies to kind of whatever. You ever see it? I'm not going to try to do a first impression of this. You ever, okay, I don't, first service I tried to do it, it was bad, okay? But you know, just a, a horse just like snorting and like kicking its leg. Like that's the word that's being used here to describe Jesus. Jesus was deeply moved. He was, he was mourning, like he was sad, but he's also just, the word conveys disgust and disdain along with it. Is that, is that making sense? And he's, he's almost just like frustrated and annoyed at it as he's deeply moved by his, um, so, so Jesus is deeply moved as he came to the tomb. He's gearing up for battle, in other words. And then in verse 43, it says in our translation, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. That word called out more literally into our English could be cried out. That's why I'm asking the question, why did Jesus cry out? Same, same Greek word underneath it all. But it's a word, again, so much richer than what's conveyed in our language, that meant a great exertion of force. And the only way I can think to, the best way I can think to describe this is, have you ever watched a strongman competition on ESPN, like 100, or like whatever channel that shows that? You know, have you ever seen like these dudes just get up there? They're all from the, you know, northern Europe, all named Magnus for whatever reason. And, you know, they, you know, and they have like two refrigerators on each side that they're yoked to, and they're like going through a gauntlet down the, you know, the football field or whatever. You, whenever they're doing that, or they're picking up a boulder that weighs the side, you know, the way the size of a small car. What are they doing? They let out just this guttural like heave to try to muster up as much power that they can in order to do whatever it is they're getting ready to do. That's the word that our writer chose to use to describe what Jesus did when he says he cried out. Does this make any sense? So here's the question. Why do you cry out? Like to that degree. Why did Jesus just, you know, just everything in him cry out as he's trying to, as he's getting ready to call Lazarus out of the tomb. I mean, this is such a strong word. Theologians kind of geek out on it a little bit, and they're like, it's a good thing Jesus, the Son of God, specifically said Lazarus' name because he was going at it here. Other people may have come out of that tomb. You know, it's like, he just, he's so in. Why did he cry out? Particularly when we have plenty of other miracles recorded of Jesus more casually using a tone like, yeah, get up your, you know, take your mat and walk. Or... You know, be healed or whatever it is. Why this one did he just cry out to this extent? To me, the answer seems clear. It's because this was foreshadowing what he ultimately came to do. Because in the same way that Jesus cried out for Lazarus at that tomb, just a little while longer, he would go up on the cross, dying for the sins of the world, and cry out, not only for Lazarus, but for you and me to come back into relationship with him. And this is what Easter is all about. This is what the Bible is all about. This is what Christianity is all about. In a word, Jesus. And what he came to do, who he is and what he came to do. The key verse here, of course, verses are verses 25 and 26, when Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Let's notice a few things. First of all, notice the type of life Jesus is talking about. Jesus says, though you will die, yet you will live. Meaning, there's, you're going to pass away in this life, but you will live. Meaning, you will live forever. It's, he's talking about eternal life in him. Because he's the resurrection and the life. You will live forever when you're in him. And the quality of that life, just so we're absolutely clear, is talking about this shalom. This this life of living with God as life was ultimately intended to be, meaning without pain and suffering and death any longer part of the equation. 
And it's really fascinating to kind of think about this. It struck me this week that, you know, as cool as, a, as cool of a miracle as it was for Lazarus, that on that day he was raised to life, and he came out of the empty tomb, he still went on to die. I mean, you know what I mean? Like a few years later, however long he had left, he was put back into another tomb, or maybe the same tomb. I don't know. His bones are still, you know what I'm saying? But because Jesus is the resurrection and the life, because of Easter, Lazarus' victory was not the day he came out of the tomb. Lazarus' victory was the day Jesus came out of the tomb for him. And he did the same thing for you and me. I am the resurrection and the life, Jesus said. Do you believe this? The second thing I want us to notice here is the incredible statement that is. Real quickly, the context was Martha, Lazarus' sister, had come to Jesus after Lazarus passed away, and she has this interaction with Jesus, like, oh, if you only had been here, and Jesus is like, he's going to rise again, I'm going to handle it. She, and she says in that moment, oh, I understand, he will come to life at the, end of the, at the end of times, like, I understand that. And that's when Jesus says this, he says, I am the resurrection of life. Meaning, Martha, in a way, was saying, oh, Jesus, I understand the doctrine, I understand how, I understand the doctrine of how that works, and Jesus says, no, no, you don't understand, I am the doctrine. He's taking something abstract and saying, making it very deeply personal. He's saying, it's not about doctrine, it's about me and what you do with me if you believe and receive me. Christianity at the end of the day is not about making bad people good. Christianity at the end of the day is about making dead people alive. Ephesians 2 verse 1 says, and you are dead in your transgressions. Dead. Ephesians 2 5 says, but you are made alive in Christ. It's not about following doctrine. It's about following Jesus. Now, please don't mis misunderstand me. Doctrine is important. God cares about doctrine. But the point is, ultimately, it's not about doctrine. It's ultimately about, Christianity ultimately is about what you make of Jesus and what he has done for you. Will you believe him? Will you receive him? Um, and really, that's what it comes down to, just receiving him. Christianity, therefore, is not just about, you know, trying to live a good life, going to church, saying your prayers, or fill in the blank. It's really just, do you receive Jesus? Now, these things are important. God cares about them. But ultimately, that's not what it's about. It's what you make of Jesus and what he did specifically on the cross for you, for your sins. Will you receive him? It's the same question that he asks us today that he asked back then. Do you believe this? And just to press this thought just a little bit further... You know, think about what Lazarus brought to his resurrection. Answer, nothing. Lazarus brought a dead body to his resurrection. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. All we can do is but receive him. And the same question Jesus asked then, he asks of us today, do you believe this? Uh, when you came in today on your seat, hopefully you saw uh, what is, says is a, a Easter response card. I wonder if you'd look at that with me for a moment. I just think there's such an opportunity on Easter to put a little spiritual marker in the ground. Some of you, you know, today's a day that you, you can utilize to make a, a step in your spiritual journey. We want to come alongside you and give you that opportunity to the extent that that's helpful to you, support, support you in that, celebrate that with you. But I wonder if... if what we see Jesus doing with Martha is the same thing that he does with us today, and that is give us an opportunity to go from the abstract in our faith to saying, no, I'm it's about you, and I believe I receive you, Jesus. I want to follow you. And so some of you today, your next step is, I, I, today I'd like to start following Jesus. You've heard enough. You know enough. You know, you know enough about Jesus, which is really what it ultimately comes down to. You want to take hold. You want to receive the resurrection and the life that Jesus offers you the same way today as he offered Martha on that day 2,000 years ago. And you can receive that. Now, checking a box does not bring you into relationship with God. It's what t takes place in our heart. But you can use this as a little spiritual marker on the ground. We'll pray for you. We will also want to resource you. Um, the team put together a wonderful uh, gift bag that you can take uh, a filled out card and, and give it to the, their, to the team at the connection table. They'd love to give you a little um, gift bag filled with some pretty actually cool goodies in here, to be honest with you. Um, but the one, one thing I want to highlight, if you've been here for a length of time, you know I like this book. We'd love to gift you uh, a book called Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. I love this book. It's so helpful for a couple of reasons. 
One, it's written by a guy, C.S. Lewis, who came to faith as a Christian late in his life and in his earlier years was a staunch atheist and an atheist who's, who spent much of his energy trying to debate and argue Christians out of their faith. Meaning, this is not written by somebody who grew up in the church or who hasn't looked at Christianity through a critical lens. Is that making sense? So it's helpful in that sense. The other thing that I think is really helpful about this book is C.S. Lewis uniquely has the gift of speaking both to the mind and the heart. So many books out there, humbly speaking from my perspective, maybe do one or one of the two kind of well in, say, for instance, speaking just to the mind, but it's thoughtful, but dry, or speaking just to the heart where, sure, it has, you know, it's interesting, but it's, it lacks substance. Uh, C.S. Lewis excels in both, and this is, this is just his best. And so we'd love to give that to you if it'd be a help, help to you. And um, uh, if you're ready to make a, a decision today, we'd love to come alongside you and, and resource you in that. Some of you today would like to start following Jesus today. Uh, you could check that box. Uh, some of you are ready to come back to your faith. Some of you, maybe it was, it's, it's going all the way back to the pandemic. Maybe it's, you know, going back to the time when you first moved to the Silicon Valley, whenever that was for you. Maybe it's going back to a time where you just made a decision based on certain circumstances in your life. Whatever the case, you walked away from your faith in God. You walked away from God. You walked away from his church. And you know what's amazing about God's scriptures? I mean, not only does he celebrate with just such deep joy when people enter into his family for the first time and he receives them as sons and daughters, he also celebrates with arms open wide those, uh, wide those who come back to him in relationship. And if that's you today, we want to come alongside you, celebrate you, give you a gift bag as well to be hopefully helpful to you, be praying with and for you in that. And then the last box on here, if you want to check it, is uh, today I'd like to consider baptism. Some of you guys are ready to publicly declare your faith by baptism. Baptism is not something that saves us. Remember, we don't bring anything to the table, including, you know, a quote-unquote good work of baptism. Baptism is just something we do because Jesus told us to do it, and if he's our Lord, we follow him. And the reason he told us to do it is, well, it's a way of us publicly declaring, I am yours and you are mine, and to do that with brothers and sisters in the faith. And if you've never done that, you're a follower of Jesus, I would actually go out on a limb and say, that's, that's actually your next step. And we'd love to talk to you about that. Come alongside and, and, and uh, celebrate that with you. The team does an awesome job. And actually, we have baptisms scheduled, I, I believe, in the next month or so. So if you'd like to be a part of that, we'd love to include you. Uh, last but not least... This is actually more of a write-in because I just, there's just three checkboxes. If you came in today or you're at the place where you just feel curious, I'm curious, you can go ahead and write those words in. I'm curious, and we'd love to give you a gift bag too. In many ways, we started current with you in mind, and we throw groups from time to time specifically for people just asking questions about Christianity, and we'd love to uh, be a support to you in any way that we can. All right. What about... For those who've been following Jesus, what does this text mean? What does this Easter message here in John 11 have for you and me? And to me, it seems like there's an invitation to trust in Christ more fully with our lives, given what he's done for us. Um, I was deeply encouraged by Martha's interactions with Jesus this week as, as I was preparing, doing my study. Because as I was Reading about Martha's interactions with Jesus, the things that she had said, I was just like, boy, I see my faith and lack of faith in her words just so clearly. I wonder if, if you can relate and see the same. Because in her distress, when Jesus first gets to Bethany, and she, you know, Lazarus has already been in the tomb for four days, she goes up to him and says this, if only you had been here, Lord, then Lazarus would still be alive. And then she adds, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. What a beautiful, nuanced picture of the complexities of faith. Can any of you relate to that? I, if only you had been here, but even now I know. <laughs> What's she doing? What's she saying? She's saying, Jesus, I trust, I trust that you care. I trust that you're capable. I'm just questioning the extent of that in my life. Can any of you relate? I know I can relate. If you're a follower of Jesus, that's, that's our faith more often than we probably care to admit. Maybe that's some of you right now. You're going through so much distress. You're going through so much suffering. You're facing some scary things. Maybe you're facing death itself or someone in your life whom you care deeply for is facing death. The promise of the story is we might not see it resolve the way that we would script it ourselves. The promise is infinitely greater than that. 
The promise is that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, life in the fullness sense that we truly need, and that he's working all things, yes, for the good of those who love him, which means you and I can trust that he cares and he's with us, and he'll do what is best in our lives, even if we don't see it or understand it. God loves you. He loves you in your suffering to the degree that he weeps, even though he knows the answer. He knows the end game. He weeps because his heart breaks for the things that frankly break your heart and mine. He loves you and cares for you and is, is with you. And the same question that he asked Martha on that day is the same question he asked today. Do you believe? And here's the thing I find just extra encouraging. We'll end with this. There comes a point where Martha comes back to Jesus when he's gearing up finally a little bit later to go to the tomb. Martha kind of inserts herself. Did you see that when we read it? She's like, hey, Jesus. You know, he's deeply moved, going to the tomb, getting ready to do his thing. And Martha goes, hey, you might not want to do that. There's a bad odor. I love that, that that's details in there. What was she doing? She's like, Jesus, I don't know. And the best part is Jesus doesn't go, Martha, we just talked about this. Didn't we just say, believe in me, and I'm going to take care of it? It's like, I, you know what, Martha, we're done. I'm done. Cut. Like, we're not doing this anymore. Your faith is too pitiful. I can't work with this. No. What does Jesus do? He says, oh, Martha, did I not tell you to believe he did with her what he does with you and me. Even when we struggle to believe, trust him, though he died for us, he goes, you can believe in me. Jesus cares for you. He loves you to the degree that he weeps over the things that break your heart. He is, he is your resurrection in your life. Do you believe this? Can you live in it? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the best news of all. That death has been defeated. On the cross and then ultimately through the empty tomb and raising your son to life, you defeated death and earned for us resurrection and life that we can have shalom restored with you forever. We thank you for this. We don't deserve it in the least. In fact, if anything, we... We not only don't bring anything to the table, if anything, we kind of bring or push ourselves away from the table, but you, you sought us out in your love. And you went to the cross, taking the initiative upon yourself to cry out for each of us. And Father, forgive those of us who've been following you for any number of years where we know this goodness about you, we know the wonderful promises, and yet still we struggle to think, oh, is, is he gonna, does he care? Is he able in my situation? Help us to trust you and love you. And Father, I want to pray also especially for those who've made a decision to follow you for the first time today or maybe come back to their faith today. Would you especially f help them feel your sense of, of presence in their lives? It's not about a feeling. But I pray that you would help them know that what is true is that they are secure in you, that you are the resurrection in their life. And Father, last but not least, I pray that you would help us be these things and lift these things up as a church in this community that you've placed us. What a gift. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.